From the Toronto Star, I'm Sabah Etazaz, and this matters. As immigrants, when we come to Canada and raise our children here, many of us don't know about the indigenous children of this land and what was done to them, a glaring gap in our understanding of the place we chose as home. As Canada is finally going through the painful process of identifying hundreds of children's remains buried in unmarked graves outside the sites of former residential schools, conversations around what to do next for the locations and how to mark and commemorate the sites are taking place. But these discussions have already been happening among Indigenous communities for decades. The Woodland Centre, under the ownership of the Six Nations of the Grand River Reserve and the former Mohawk Institute Residential School that's preserved as part of it, is one example of what some survivors and Indigenous communities decided to do. The survivors were very vocal about keeping the building and using it as a tool to educate people about the history of the residential schools in this country. So I think for us, a plaque just wasn't something that was the only thing we wanted to do. And as a result, the survivors have also done the own grassroots initiative having a memorial park which is going to be directly beside the school and that's sort of a way to also be a memorial and honor the children who attended these schools you know going through the school is going to be very hard it's not an easy tour to do but then you would be able to come out and sort of have that space to reflect and think in the memorial park janice montour is the executive director of the woodland center who identifies as a member of mohawk nation turtle plan Star reporter Olivia Bowden spoke to her when she visited the Woodland Centre in an effort to listen and try to understand how Canada should move forward in addressing the horrific legacy of the residential schools. How do we honour these children and remember what happened to them so that it can never happen again? She joins me now to talk about that. Hi, Olivia. Thanks for joining me on the podcast. Hi, thanks so much for having me. So, Olivia, this is such a complex issue to try to cover and one people have grappled with worldwide. How do we memorialize the sites where genocide or mass human rights atrocities have happened so that it never happens again? And I know there's no one answer or way, but how have some parts of the world done that? Are there any examples? Sure. So, you know, I think that this is an issue that has come up really worldwide because there's been more of an effort to memorialize and commemorate sites of, you know, horrific atrocities in the last few decades, usually because, you know, survivors have really gained agency in terms of having a voice. So, you know, one of my first thoughts is I did a fellowship for journalists at the Auschwitz Museum in 2019. And, you know, they brought reporters there because reporters contributed to the Holocaust. So, you know, they want to bring reporters there to show what happened and to ensure that all reporters are part of an effort to ensure, you know, something like this doesn't happen. So, you know, seeing the Auschwitz site, they preserved everything exactly as much as they could how it was after the camp was evacuated. And it's very jarring, you know emotional for most people to be there, but, you know, they really decided to retain the site specifically for education. So there's historians and guides and, you know, everyone who actually lives there 24-7 to ensure that education gets to the public. And I think that's quite admirable. So, you know, seeing that site and seeing what Indigenous people are facing here and have been going through and, you know, understanding that these former residential school sites are sites of genocide, you know, what is the best way to commemorate them is an important question. When we talk about Canada's shameful history of residential schools, we're also talking about an ongoing chapter of this history, aren't we? It's unique in the sense that these horrors that Indigenous children faced in Canada, it's not just a distant memory. People who went through that system are still alive today. Does that change how we have this conversation about memorializing these terrible events? Yes, definitely. Because, you know, the last residential school 
you know, school in quotes, because, you know, one expert I talked to really called them just death institutions. The last school closed in 1997. So you can imagine that there's thousands and thousands of survivors of these schools. And it's not even, you know, only the survivors, it's their preceding generations that have been continued to be harmed by the repercussions of the residential school sites. So not only do we have living survivors, we have living descendants who, you know, have been directly impacted by these schools through intergenerational trauma. In your report, you also address some of this complexity of this trauma for residential school survivors through the story of John Elliott, who kept running away from a residential school and now can't stop visiting the site of that suffering. Can you tell us more about him? Sure. So John attended the school for five years from age 10 to 15. And this was in the late 1940s, early 1950s. And, you know, most of his memories from this school are being severely beaten every day. You know, if there was learning, it was obviously, quote unquote, learning that was just full of anti-Indigenous rhetoric, you know, colonization mandate. But he was rarely in class. They actually, and this is well documented within, you know, all survivors of this school is that they mostly had to do farm labor for free. And any of the farm products they helped cultivate were not for them. So they weren't allowed to eat the eggs on site. They ate oatmeal, so mush, three times a day. So it was mostly labor. He didn't go to school. So obviously a horrible time at this residential school. But the reason, you know, he keeps coming back now and he's there quite often is because in the last two decades, especially, they've transformed this site into a site of education and preserving Indigenous knowledge and ways of life, and especially Indigenous languages. So they've turned it into the exact opposite of what the institution set out to do, which was to erase Indigenous people. And now that it's become, you know, the opposite and also a site for education, for schools to tour so nobody ever forgets, I think that's why, you know, he feels comfort in going back because I think the site does not represent what it did before for him. It represents a way forward for him. So John Elliott was at the uh, former Mohawk Institute, which is now part of the Woodland Cultural Center, I believe. Could you tell me a bit more about that? Is the Woodland Cultural Center one example of what commemoration looks like when it's led by Indigenous communities? Yes. So the Woodland Cultural Center, they're on the land since the school closed in 1970. And the land is back with Indigenous people. It's owned by the Six Nations So, you know, this site, they've decided to transform it into a museum, an art gallery, and they're currently within a restoration process to restore the original residential school building for tours to go through. So they did a campaign called Save the Evidence, and that's been ongoing since 2013, and they're nearly done raising the money they need. And it's been millions of dollars from community members. I Queens Park gave, I believe, $1.6 million in 2016. So they're hoping to open the school site to the public in 2024. But the museum and art gallery is open now. So, you know, they've really done this to ensure that the site is not erased so that people cannot hide from the truth that this happened. Right. That's one example. How important is it to emphasize that when it comes to memorializing something like this, there is no one size fits all approach? Because we're talking about so many different Indigenous communities here, right? It's not a monolith. Right. So, you know, even though John Elliott is one of many survivors who voted to save this site because they felt they wanted to save it, that's by no means the only or most appropriate option. You know, every Indigenous scholar that I spoke to explained that this has to be survivor led. And what the majority of survivors want for the site, which can be difficult because obviously, you know, if the majority say one thing and some survivors say something else, you know, it can be difficult to make the site what everybody wants. You know, for instance, there's multiple different options. So some really do want these school sites destroyed. So the former lower post residential school on the Yukon BC border, it was actually demolished this month on July 3rd and survivors had been asking for that site to be demolished 
demolished for years and years and years. And when it was mowed down, the survivors came, their descendants came, there were cheers. There was just relief to just be rid of this site. And I think it's really important to understand that that is a completely legitimate option. And it really just needs to be what do these survivors want most? We'll be right back. And it seems that a lot of this work has started already. This is not a new conversation, as you say. Can you talk some more about some of the work Indigenous communities have been doing around this? Sure. So even though, you know, we're settlers talking about commemoration now, this is not a new issue for Indigenous communities. They've been talking about how to commemorate these sites for decades, and especially since these schools were created to erode and sever Indigenous relationships with the land, purposefully to ensure that colonization is successful. So many of the options to commemorate or to use the site for something else have been in the same vein of going in the opposite direction. So there's one school where they've turned it into a college, actually, and they've built an entire new school on top of it that, you know, is specifically for Indigenous education. And then in BC, the former Kootenay Indian Residential School site in Cranbrook, that was converted to a golf course and a casino. And that process was completely led by the Indigenous community. But I think it's really important to remember that it's not one change and then the commemoration or the shift is done. Because, for instance, at that school site, they just discovered 182 unmarked graves at the end of June. And it's really important to understand that this is a fluid process. So, you know, it could involve ceremonies on the land. At the Woodland Cultural Center, they're building a memorial park for survivors where they can sit and reflect in silence or whatever they want next to the school, because, you know, it's not a one and done situation with these sites. Going back a few years, how did the Truth and Reconciliation Commission address this issue of commemoration? And did the government follow through? So, you know, in 2015, we have the TRC creating their calls to action and it included calls to action on commemoration. So they asked the government to develop a national heritage plan for commemorating these residential school sites, installing a residential schools national monument in Ottawa. So in 2018, Ottawa allocated nearly $24 million over five years towards creating a reconciliation framework for Canadian heritage. But in terms of the actual progress on, you know, a clear framework for each of these sites, a clear framework on Indigenous-led, survivors-led commemoration, I don't think we've seen that. Actually, they've only designated the residential school system a national historic event in September 2020. And the TRC calls are from 2015. And so far, we only have a handful of residential school sites designated national historic sites. Now, you know, a community may or may not want it to be designated that way. How much that designation actually means to them as survivors could totally vary. So, you know, it's not that every site needs to be designated such, but I think that massive national conversation on how to, you know, ensure a thorough process where funding is given, because like I said, these communities have been engaging in this process for decades, but, you know, it's been patchwork funding. Like I said, Queens Park donated to the Woodland Center, but that's an individual call for help with the Save the Evidence campaign. There isn't, you know, a real national effort in how they want to do this. And clearly that's necessary. And there's obviously been more government funding after the recent devastating recoveries of Indigenous children's remains at some of these sites, right? Is that funding enough to do some of this work as well? So most of the experts I spoke to said, you know, this is nearly not enough funding because it's $10 million to not only the recovery process of finding these unmarked graves on the site, which is costly, involves radar technology. It's also a, a painful process for Indigenous people, for survivors. So having support around that is also what that money needs to be for. And then that $10 million is supposed to also be for commemoration. So you have 17 former residential school sites in Ontario. When you divide $10 million across those 17 sites, It's only $600,000 per site. So for $600,000 to be towards commemoration 
and uncovering the Arnmark graves. You know, the Woodland Cultural Center has spent upwards of, you know, $20 million on their project. And that makes sense for what they're trying to do and creating their whole museum and everything. So Professor Eve Tuck told me that it would just be probably enough for a plaque. And we should understand that, you know, a plaque would be really insulting if it's just a plaque to commemorate what are sites of genocide here. You talked about a national conversation, which is interesting. I wanted to ask you, how important is it that this memorialization process is not seen through this settler colonial lens? Yes. So I think, you know, even if we get a national conversation going, it's really important that it's not done through the lens of the Canadian government through settlers here, because, you know, our understanding as settlers of commemoration of these sites, you know, when we see Canadian monuments, Canadian plaques, that's all done through a settler colonial lens. And, you know, there's a reason that we have all these statues to everyone who created Confederation in Canada, because that was how colonization happened here. So to have all the statues of them, it symbolizes taking away land from Indigenous people. So to follow the same plaque and statue mandate when, you know, as Indigenous scholars have told me, like this grief is fluid, you know, they're still uncovering these sites and they expect hundreds and hundreds more bodies to be found. And this is about genocide. So, you know, sticking a plaque up, it's not enough. And it's also a settler way of marking places. Mm -hmm. Especially when so many of our Indigenous communities are still dealing with the consequences of what happened. Even now, Indigenous childhoods are being interrupted systematically. It's 2021. And so many communities still don't have access to even clean water, for example, right? Yes, exactly. So much of what you and I have absorbed of history was unfortunately from a settler colonial lens because of how this information is sort of kept away from the mainstream and the education system. And many of us have been having these difficult conversations with ourselves recently. What did you take away from reporting on this and visiting some of this history that was preserved in a different way from what we normally see? I understand you visited the Woodland Cultural Center. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, visiting these sites as a settler, it's an indication of how little I actually know and how much we really need to defer to Indigenous communities. And it shouldn't even be a question. It should not be about what the Canadian government wants. You know, this land is not our land in the first place. It should be survivor led. So, you know, visiting the museum, you know, I did my undergrad in history and a lot of the conversations were about how everything we read, you know, most of what we've learned in Canada is through the lens of white historians about white men in history. So seeing the Woodland Cultural Center Museum, I saw descriptions of Indigenous communities that were finally not through that lens. And, you know, it made me realize how filtered my entire education has been. And, you know, the effort they had to go to to ensure this was done not through a white settler colonial lens. It shows how twisted a lot of the education we have received is and a lot of our own museums. And because when you take kids to museums, if it's not done in the right way, that's how you end up with adults who, you know, not only don't understand, but, you know, actively work to oppress people. And this is why that education is so important. So for the Woodland Center, it was not only about the harm Indigenous communities have faced. It was also about how much Indigenous communities have, you know, the wonderful things they've done, their contributions to art and culture and everything like that, and how they're still here and they're not going anywhere. That was also a big part of the museum. Well, thank you so much, Olivia, for reporting on this and sharing it with us. Thank you so much. I was speaking to star reporter Olivia Bowden. That's it for today. Thanks so much for listening. This Matters is hosted and produced by me, Sabai Tazaz, Adrian Chung, and Raju Mutter. Produced and mixed by Sean Pattenden. And our director of programming is JP Fozo. Our show theme music is by So Called. And our episode music is by Mike DeAngelis. We want to hear what stories matter to you. Please send us comments, questions, or ideas to thismatters at thestar.ca. Please consider supporting the journalism the Toronto Star Newsroom does at thestar.com. 
Don't forget to subscribe to This Matters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Let's talk soon. Thank you.